From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. Now, those of you who've seen previous Wednesday Yachting Luncheons recognize that the bandage is new. Then you've also been told by everybody that if you're a sailor, you need to get lots and lots of suntan lotion on your face. Well, I learned for sure that that's the truth. I discovered a little bit of precancerous growth on the top of my nose. And after a couple of visits with my doctor, they cut out a little piece of that part of my skin right now. So uh, take those words from your doctor and your parents and your friends to heart and put suntan lotion on your face. I race about 80 races a year, so I needed it more than the average person. And I want to ask everybody else to be even smarter than I was about using suntan lotion. Our speaker today is a example of incredible grit and determination. He started sailing Opties at age eight in the beautiful Larchmont Yacht Club, which if you've been to is a wonderful place with a saltwater swimming pool right on Long Island Sound, terrific environment. And he progressed through 420s up to 49ers, became an All-American sailing for Harvard, where he graduated with a BS in economics. He went on to Columbia, where he earned a master's in statistics. And after not making the Tokyo Games in their 49er, he is now preparing for the Paris Olympics in 2024. He's currently in Greece, getting ready for the European Championships. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Hi, Ron. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. We just finished up training for five weeks at St. Francis, and we spent about a month there every year since we began sailing the 49er back in 2017. And those months are really important in our campaign because as we'll get into later, there's just some moments in the 49er where it's 20, 25 knots and there's only like five to 10 boats in the world that can sail around the course. And I remember the first time we came to San Francisco, we were going to sail for about 30 days. Before we went out the first day, I said, okay, guys, uh, let's try to average less than one flip per day. So less than, less than 30 flips in the month. And the first day we went out and flipped five times. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, we set ourselves back a little bit on that initial goal. Um, here, let's see. I think we have a photo of one such flip. Here you can see one of the many more than 30 flips we had that month. There's a, <laughs> a little bit of head scratching involved. I drive, and so I'm there sitting on the mast pulling the kite down, because, and Ian, my crew, is sitting on the center board uh, wondering what just happened. <laughs> you, in the 49er, the crew is working all the time, working way harder than the helmsman. And so when you flip, the crew gets a second off while well, the Comes when it thinks about what he's done and uh, pulls the kite down. <laughs> this is what it should look like in San Francisco. Uh, please note here that we're going upwind, which is substantially easier. These months we've had sailing out of St. Francis have been some of the most productive in, productive in our entire campaign. And I, we're really lucky to live in a country that has both San Francisco and St. Francis that promotes such high caliber sailing and is in such a good place to train. There's nowhere better to train than City Front San Francisco. The second professional series in sailing in America was the uh, Ultimate 30s. And when we sailed our Ultimate 30 Hexel back in the early 90s, Silvestri and Craig Healy and Stevie Erickson and I, we all decided the thing we had to learn how to do was recover from capsizing because everybody capsizes usually more than once a race, just like you're talking about. And we actually had a, a whole series of drills. If we capsize going down the breeze, which as you mentioned, is more likely. We each had a number, one through eight of the eight-person crew, and we each had a whole series of things we had to do. And the last guy on the boat was Russ, who was the driver, Sylvester, and he, we would lastly pull him up off the transom. He'd crawl straight up the transom. In the meantime, by that time, we had the boat rolling again. So tell us when you guys flip, what is your process? If you flip down the breeze, what are your steps one through infinity? It depends. There's so many different ways you can flip. And you're exactly right. You need to train uh, for how to flip because there's some 49er races, even at the highest level, where it's quite windy. And you can say before the start, OK, if we don't capsize, we'll be top five in this race. And if we do capsize, we need to keep racing like through the entire capsize because you can still finish sixth. When you capsize, the 49er immediately wants to turtle. So it wants to go all the way up fully upright uh, with the centerboard sticking out of the water. There's <laughs> certain areas in the race course where uh, uh, where everybody capsizes. It's usually at the top mark or at the point where you need a jive to go to the gate or at the gate. 
And so in a very strong race, you'll see five or 10 boats capsized in exactly that spot. And people refer to it as the graveyard because you have all the tombstones of the rudder and centerboard sticking up. Out of the, out of the but yeah, the first step is to not turtle. So you capsize them. The mast is laying horizontal to the water uh, and you don't want it to go all the way. The crew balances on the board, not letting the boat right and not letting the turtle. It can be very dangerous if you right too quickly. You can break a spreader. Or, there's a lot of load on, on the boat in this moment. Uh, and meanwhile, the helmsman... Uh, dances uh, and sits on top of the mast and pulls the vinegar down. They, they re the kite. Uh, in this case, this picture right here, you've now got the boat position, so the mast is upwind, and yeah, you're exactly. just getting ready to start to begin to ride it. Is that what's happening? Yeah, exactly. People who are familiar with the geography of San Francisco will note that it's Alcatraz in the back, and the mast is pointing at the Golden Gate. What's the optimal crew weight? What are you looking to weigh in Paris? Yeah, we haven't learned too much about the venue uh, for Paris yet. Uh, the Olympics in 2024 will be in Paris, but the racing will be down in Marseille on the southern coast. And down on the southern coast of France in the summer, they have this unusual wind called Mistral, like you mentioned, uh, which can be quite strong. It blows from the north. Um, it's not storm-driven. It's just uh, it's temporal. It can be up to 30, 40 knots. Um, I've actually never seen it. I raced down there once, but we just... Didn't get lucky. We never had it. And when it, when the Mistral is not in, it can be pretty light, like five to 10 knots. So we need to learn a lot more about the venue before I can say too much about the target weight. At the moment, we are in uh, Thessaloniki, Greece for the Europeans. Thessaloniki is Greece's second city, but it's not so well known internationally. It's more industrial and doesn't really have the, the same tourist appeal as, as Athens. But I've heard the Yacht Club's great, and uh, we're pretty excited for the racing here. So what I really want to talk about today is basically what my story has been in the 49er, where when you watch the Olympics or you really you read about any sailor you'd see in a magazine, you're reading about the stars, like people who've been just winning everything since they were three years old. And those are the stories people like. People love to learn about the personalities. I love to learn about them as well. But I, I have a different story. If I work very hard, get lucky, honestly, uh, I can maybe just one day arrive to that level, put together some performances where we compete with them and maybe beat them. But I'm going to need to grind. And this is what I enjoy about sailing. It's what I enjoy about anything, like seeing how far I can push myself and like exactly what I can eke out of with a little bit less talent. A lot of my career will be ch like chasing stars. Like here we have uh, the two guys that have um, been dominant in the 49er class for all, Peter Burling and uh, Blair Took out of New Zealand. You're constantly trying to copy. Every second that uh, you're in the boat park or getting to race against any of these guys, you're trying to steal little things. Like, how do they do this? Like, oh, can we copy that? And the other thing is you got to always be listening to the people around you. Another person I'll talk about later is uh, Martine Grail and her crew, Kaina from Brazil, uh, who just uh, won back-to-back -back gold medals in the FX. They're just another example of some rare type of person that I get to try to emulate. When you meet a medalist, they're not like anybody else you, you meet going about your life. I, I get, I'm very fortunate to get to travel around, meet tons of different people in a lot of communities. And wherever you go, you see that, and people are somewhat similar in, in every different location. There's some differences, but they use, they use some of the same phrases. They express some of the similar ideas. But when you meet a medalist, you meet somebody who's like really just made their own way. You can tell they're a completely independent thinker. Like they're not towing any line. Every moment in their life is a chance to optimize and try to win a little bit out of this scenario. That is what I'm trying to learn how to do. That's where I want to end up one day. But Unlike some of these people, I wasn't born like that. And so I enjoy the process of trying to arrive there. And I want to share a little bit about how I'm trying to get there and where we're going. First, a little bit more in depth about how I started and why I decided that this is what I loved. I had a somewhat traditional junior sailing career. I started in Opties at Large Penny Yacht Club in A1s and A2s, they're going to sail class. I owe everything to my parents. Uh, I don't know how they did it because they had four kids. I'm the oldest. And they just introduced us to four sports every season i was playing like baseball soccer lacrosse hockey everything you name swimming uh, and sailing was just like the eighth or ninth sport they introduced us to like anybody who gets to the top or near the top in anything just got insanely lucky at some point but i'm so lucky i got exposed to sailing because so neither of my parents sail they both grew up in the middle of the country like they could have easily just never dropped us off at sailing camp that first day. I mean, the joke was on them because they ended up driving us to sailing events for the next like 10 years. Here, here you can see me driving, uh, sailing with my brother, Matthew, uh, who's crewing. And you can tell what it's like growing up sailing around in New York. Cause this is probably 
early October and we're probably freezing. I started in Opti's, progressed to 420s and then sailed 29ers with my brother. Best that the Charles River has ever looked. Uh, there's like three days a year when it's like 80 and 15 knots. Uh, <laughs> and the whole ball the skyline. It took me a while to find the front of the fleet. Like in opt Opti's, 420s, 29ers, and then in college, I really struggled my first year, had a battle, wasn't sure I was going to make it, had a battle some more. And then at the end, wasn't the best, but was near enough to the top that I was like, okay, I'm going to make the next step. I, I really love what I'm doing. Like, I, I want to go on and see if I can succeed at the next level. After college, um, I, w I wasn't sure if I was going to do this full time. And so I did one year uh, sailing 49ers part time and also going to grad school. Uh, and I got a master's in statistics. Fortunately, in that period of time, uh, I teamed up with uh, Ian, who you can see on the right here. Ian and I have an interesting uh, yin yang where I'm 27, he's currently 22. He's been prodigiously good at sailing since he was nine years old. Like, I think he made, he was top 10 in Opti's twice by the age of 12. And then, was, as you can see in this photo, was too big and moved on. He won the youth champs when he was 15 and was on the Olympic sailing scene by the time he was 17 or 18. I wouldn't be sailing at this level or at this time commitment, uh, wasn't sounding like somebody who could really get all the way there. So I'm insanely lucky to have teamed up with him and got to know his family so well. Ian and I made a uh, team up in 2017. We made a campaign for the Tokyo Olympics and it had some ups and downs. In that period of time, went from just starting to top 15 in the world, which if you give anybody four years in one of the top classes and say, you're going to be mm, top 15 at the end of it, they should take that. Like it's hard to move up. Uh, for all, but really a handful of people. I think we're proud of a lot of the progress we made, but at the same time, we failed to qualify for the Olympics, failed to qualify for uh, the country. Uh, and as a result, uh, we're, we're out for revenge on the next time. If you want to see the fickleness of sailing results, it, you can look at, it must have been July and August 2019, where we went to the Pan American Games, uh, which was an incredible experience to represent the U.S. and throw down against some of the best sailors in North and South America. Uh, but at the same time, we, we lost to the Canadians who were ranked far lower than us. And as a result, seriously dented our, our Olympic hopes. And then only three weeks later in Japan uh, at the World Cup event against every single boat, but pretty much all the top boats finished eighth, had our best result. Uh, and you can see here it was nuking. Uh, and you, you can see, uh, if you look at our faces here, I think you can see some of the terror that you feel when you're going down the way of hoping the bow goes up the next one. Explain to the audience, when you're over the ley line and you got to get down, the danger of trying to make up for being a bit over the ley line. But with a symmetrical cut, you sail angles downwind. And when it's quite strong, the only directions the 49er can safely point when it's strong are almost dead downwind or, or almost straight upwind. Any other angle, you have so much sail area exposed to the wind that you're going to capsize almost immediately. And so in strong wind, if you're over ley line downwind, you need to put the bow up towards the wind and you expose <laughs> so much area that the boat's in serious risk. Interestingly, what th this might be a little counterintuitive to people, but you can all you can ease the sail substan uh, significantly enough that uh, you don't have too much scared of flipping to leeward. But when you ease the, the main sail, which has a square top, you expose so much area pushing the bow down that suddenly you have quite a, quite a potential to pitch pull. So here we've overlay line, we've put the kite down, we put, and then put the bow up towards the wind. And we're going down a wave, hoping that we go back up the next one. The process of improving at sailing is very nonlinear because the story of this summer was that we'd spent a, one month training in San Francisco, think, thought we made a ton of gains, went to the Pan American Games, it went into the medal race tied for second with the Canadians. Uh, it was 30 knots. Everybody capsized 15 times maybe. And they capsized one time less than us and, and took the medal in the Olympic berth. Then we go to Japan. It's at 20 knots and huge waves. And we, we have our best result of our career. Beat the Canadians by a ton and uh, beat a lot of other boats ranked more highly than us. So it, it's very nonlinear. You can go to crazy chasing results. You need to go to San Francisco and put in hours and hours and hours of build capability. Let's get into some of the things that uh, people have taught me along the way about how to go about this process of trying to eke out a little bit more capability in the 49er. The first tip one of our coaches ever gave us was like, I'll put step here or something. I'm like, how do you know that? Like, like why couldn't I figure this out myself? Uh, and he goes, don't worry. 
everything I'm going to tell you, somebody else taught me. We're all just handing off the information that somebody else gave us. And I really like that because it takes away a little bit of the stress of why didn't I figure this out? Like, how, how did this take me so long? But I want to modify it in one way. 95% of what we know, somebody else will have taught us. And we get to add 5%. And this, you can get excited about this 5%. This is what you get to contribute. This is what you get to like focus on, develop. And then what do you get to pass on to people? This is what you get to contribute to like what we're all, all the knowledge we're just constantly passing on to the people who come after us. And also understanding that it's only 5%, I think can kind of keep you focused because it's easy to experiment too much, like not always trust the advice you're getting. But if you understand that you're only going to add 5%, you can just go about Go about your job, do uh, follow the advice you're given, follow the coaching. And when you think you have an idea, understand that you're not going to, you're not going to innovate as much as you might think. This is not tech. This is not some like young industry, like that people have been doing exactly what we're working on for years. And so and to get to the top level, you need to copy quite a bit and you're going to develop a little bit along the way, but you get to like, make sure the nuggets that you add are small and smart and they should be right. And there's no pressure to. Uh, to turn around on them as, as fast as it feels like sometimes. That's the first lesson. Yeah, like 95% of what you know, somebody else is going to teach you. And the 5% will come uh, when it does. Then one of the most useful things that somebody's ever taught me uh, is the difference between capability and results. As you put in more and more hours, you gain more experience, you're just going to slowly get better at everything you do. Meanwhile, the results you experience in sailing or in anything else are going to vary wildly around the slow upward trend of your capability. And if you tie your emotions or if you get too stuck on uh, on your last result, you're gonna have a very difficult time slowly developing that capability because one day you're gonna feel amazing, one day you're gonna feel terrible. This idea can also help really help you focus on what your core task is, which is just this slow increase of capability. You want to, just increase the rate of that. That's that's where greatness is. This is what I what I've been taught, and this is why I hope it's true. That greatness is in slightly increasing the rate at which you gain capability, and it's going to be impossible to do anything other than raise it from pretty slow to slightly less slow. Uh, you, you're not going to make big leaps in this regard. Uh, maybe when you try a new task, when you learn a new skill, yeah, you're going to make tons of gains in the first couple of days. Like my brother is um, a very passionate rock climber. Um, that's what, that's his jam. Like the, he loves it. He, he works and on his weekends he travels and goes, cl goes climbing out West. He lives in Denver. Uh, and er maybe once a year I fly out and visit him. And I rock climbed a little bit growing up, but I don't do it now. And you need to be very strong, especially in your forearms to climb. And it's incredible. I'll, I'll do one or two workouts the week before I go out and, and, and visit him. And because I'm so weak, because I haven't done this in a while, you make incredible gains in those few days. But anything that we do consistently, anything you enjoy and practice a lot, you're going to be at the stage where the rate of progression is quite slow, but the results can vary wildly around. It. And another way that this idea helps quite a bit is with teamwork or, and having patience uh, with your teammates and your coach, where if you take a step back and think about how is their career going to progress, they're going to have good days and bad days. but as you put the hours in, they're just going to slowly get better. After the first few months, they're never going to make a big jump. And they're never, unless they get injured or something, they're never going to so suddenly get worse. Like any, anything you see other than, than a slight upward trend in their ability is uh, you're imagining it or you're just focusing too much on an immediate result. And this very much helps you have patience. It helps you believe in them. Uh, it, 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 this idea is, I've gotten a lot of mileage out of this idea, both working with myself and uh, and working with other people. And I think there's there's no, maybe no story better to describe this idea than once uh, we, uh, we were training in Santander uh, last year and my coach was telling me, okay, you need to make these steps as you run across the boat to tack. You need to move your body in this way. He told me that one day. We were focusing on 20 other things, totally forgot about it. He came in, he told me it again, went out the next day, we were racing in a battle this other boat, Totally forgot about it. Told me it again. Six days in a row. He, every day, didn't make the steps. Came in. He told me to do it. On the sixth day, we're going to rest the next day. We've been saying one week. I hadn't made the, I hadn't made the body movement once that he was asking for. And I said, I'm so sorry. Like, I, I just spent one week and we didn't make any progress on this. You told me six times. My coach said, don't worry. I know I'm going to have to tell you 20 times. 
today was time number six. One day it will be time number 20 and then you'll know it. how progress works in that. With that question in the air, how many steps do you take across the cockpit and what about the crew? If you're filming from the back, you should only see one person. The two people should be making steps together. And this is the, the same in every boat. I don't know why it, boats respond so much better when two people move in unison. People who've sailed a 420 or an FJ will know that if two people roll just as hard, but a second split from each other, the boat barely moves. And if they roll half as much, but exactly together, the boat will capsize immediately. I, I don't understand the physics of it, frankly, but the, the sensation is remarkable. But yeah, so the, the helmsman crew should move together. Uh, on the tack, it's three steps. And on the jive, it's four steps because uh, you need one step to get out of the foot strap. And so an interesting uh, way to jump into some of the other ideas that uh, I've been working on that people have taught me, I think, uh, is to discuss the professionalization, which has occurred in Olympic sports over the last 30 years. And one debate, which happens a lot, which is are sports, either Olympic or, profession or American professional, are they occurring at a higher level today than they were occurring 20 or 40 years ago? And here you can see, for instance, these are the um, uh, gold medal winning times in the men's 100 meter sprints. And you can see that since the Olympics began, they've gone down substantially. Like people have been getting faster. It's easy to look at this and say, okay, like, yes, with everything that's going on in modern society, athletes are performing at a higher level today uh, than they were a while ago. And then people may claim, okay, if you, if you took, uh, say, a former Olympic champion, like if you took Carl Lewis uh, and, and put him in the final today, he, would, he wouldn't do as well. Uh, he wouldn't be, maybe he wouldn't make the final. Uh, like people uh, love to say, like, what would happen if Michael Jordan came and played in the NBA now? Uh, some people argue that, oh, no, that like the level is so much higher today than it was in the 90s that he would he would be just some average all star. And other people say, no, no, the league was a lot tougher back in uh, back in the 90s. Like it's uh, he would still clean up today. Uh, like it, how would somebody do like if you took uh, uh, some of the champions uh, in sailing in the 90s or the 80s and put them in the fleet today? Well, like would they? still clean up. And so first, before we can really have this discussion, certain sports have changed. So for instance, this is uh, Jesse Owen digging in before the 100 meter sprints. There was no starting blocks. They brought a shovel out onto the clay track and dug a hole and started from there. And so certain sports just have changed. Like in sailing, for instance, there's been such an increase in the uh, quality of the material. Now everything's carbon fiber. All the boats are much lighter. The clothing people are wearing is uh, much slimmer and, but, and higher tech and warmer. <laughs> Sailing must have been so cold back in the day. God <laughs> bless it. And so technology has changed sports. It's just, you can't compare its apples and oranges to say, oh, is somebody better or worse than they were before. In 1936, Jesse Owen, the uh, American who cleaned up in uh, the Berlin Olympics, you can see those two dots. We ran at 10.3 which is really not that far off. That's faster than plenty of people are running uh, in the heats at the Olympics today. Like, but before, w without the technological changes and without some of these auxiliary components that are now helping performance, he was, he still had this core ability, which was uh, uh, like extremely competitive. And it, it seems like, yeah, okay. He, like these people, like, I'm not sure there's so much difference between uh, the like underlying ability that athletes had decades ago and what they have today. Another example is that it, many track and field events, the world record was set uh, in the 90s uh, still or the early 2000s. So like uh, this is Javier Sotomayor from Cuba who set this currently standing world record high jump in 1993. You know, the thing about high jumping too, I was a high jump and now... Uh, my youngest wow. daughter was the county champion in high jumping. And what's so amazing is it's such a mental sport. You see this right here. It's so mental. You you could jump a height that you've already jumped, 6'4 or something like that. And then what happens is if you move the bar up like an inch, all of a sudden, so many things change in your brain. You can't get there. The Cuban was so amazing because it was more his mental frame of mind that overcame the physical ability to literally throw his body that high in the air. If you want an example of how sports have changed, uh, in the original high jumps, there was no padding. They just landed in sand. Yes, and then sawdust, right. It was going to jump over this and then just like hit the sand after. I don't know. <laughs> but what my takeaway from this is, and, uh, is that in 
every sport, there's some core underlying skill, which is where all the return is. You can innovate on the margins. Like you can improve the fitness, like the fitness training, the nutrition, the psychology, and you can get all the same tech that everybody else is competing with. But it, getting at that core underlying skill, it, the ability to just the, the twitch in your muscles, the ability to, the, the mental ability to be ready to go when it's time to jump as high as you can. That is something which is so like, innate to the human condition that sort of defies innovation maybe in sailing specifically what this looks like there's two things you need to do in sailing you need to make the boat go fast the like core ability that you're trying that you need to do those on the speed side is the sensation like feeling little bits of pressure difference in the rudder and the sheets and little bits of difference in the speed of the boat through the water like just being able to sense small changes in speed uh, without instruments is a really important ability in Olympic sailing let's put the bow down here the boat's only going to accelerate a tenth of a knot or something. You need to be able to feel that tenth of a knot from the water rushing under you or the wind on your face. In your strategic role, uh, you need to constantly move your awareness around. This is something that you can't you can't innovate towards outside of the actual practice of it. Always know where the strategic priority is and just automatically flip between those. Like like head on, head on a swivel, but always at, at the priority. One thing which if there's any change in sports, which maybe has a chance of um, helping athletes or sailors develop this, these, these core skills, it's analytics. Uh, it's like the, the debrief afterwards, like making that more powerful, more insightful, cutting time out as they try to figure out what the step is that they need to uh, focus on in the next practice to develop that core skill. I'm not sure there's so much return on this. One thing we talk about frequently is uh, instruments. Like in, in Olympic sailing, you're seeing more and more people put sensors and weather sticks on boats in practice or have GPS tracking. Um, and this can help the breakdown, uh, help you break down the practice, help you understand where the loss is, like where you can make the next gain. At the same time, we've discussed that maybe it kills sensitivity. In Olympic sailing, all you get is a magnetic, is a compass. You don't get any other instruments uh, that you would have on a big boat. And so you you only have your sensation to trim the sails. And if you put too many, if you spend your practice time reading instruments, maybe that takes away time that you would spend building the sen building sensation. For me, the jury's out on uh, whether or not the increased instrumentation uh, in Olympic sailing is going to see big returns for sailors or not. This is the current question that we're dealing with, like how to develop that core skill, the skills with the big return, like the sensitivity and the sheets and the driving, and then the ability to flip awareness between the current like racing priority. Is the question you're asking right now, how best to train your sensitivity to differences in change in speed and in performance with instruments or without instruments? Is that the question? The question and I do not have the answer to it. And if anybody thinks they have a good answer, please get in contact with me because I want to know. <laughs> is what can we do to increase the rate at which we're gaining sensitivity, driving and in, in the sheeting, and then the ability to uh, like flip awareness between the priorities in the race course. Like, okay, we're watching the wind. Now we're watching this package over here, this package of boats over here, because if they split too hard, we need to go with them. Uh, like, okay, now we need to find the bias in the next leg. Uh, and are we going to straight set or not? Uh, the, doing all that fluidly, just in the moment, this is where the racing motability is. And, and so this is what we're grappling with. This is why I don't have the answer to at the moment. Maybe it's taken me some years, but I've arrived. And okay, this is my understanding of what the core question is. How can we increase the rate at which we're building those skills? I remember it, two small data points I have on this uh, that... Or, or what I'm currently chewing on is before, right before everybody went to Tokyo, we made one week training with this Austrian team here, uh, Ben and David, uh, who they just won the pre-Olympics. Uh, everybody thought they were going to medal in for, they didn't have their strongest event. They finished eighth, but, uh, they were, everybody thought they were looking pretty hot going in. And we would, the practice consisted of some drills in the morning, breaking down the race into the small parts and then some racing afterwards. And, so th this is one of the top teams. This is a team we've been chasing for four years. When we uh, were training one-on-one -on -one with them in, in small drills, we were right next to them the whole time. It was very surprising. We, we weren't just getting uh, lapped. Then we were out to the racing, and they, we, could, we couldn't keep up. Like it, they could just put everything together in, when it counted in the moment in a way that, that we didn't have.
maybe you get into a class and you spend the first uh the first few years like uh learning exactly how you need to tack how you need to jibe what how you accelerate the boat what ang what the angles look like on the race course all the components now it's putting it together the, and and this is this is what i'm this is what i'm thinking about at night like how do how do i put it all together automatically in the moment. What are next steps for us? Um, what do the next few weeks look like? We're currently digesting all the media that came out of the Olympics because uh, Gary did a great job commentating uh, and just the Olympic broadcasts were incredible. And the onboard footage uh, it was some of the best it, like shots into a boat that you'll ever get. And so uh, we're going through it, breaking it down, stealing little tips off everybody. Th this is what something that really excites you if you uh, are a student of these sorts of things. And then there's a lot of changes coming up in the 49er class. Uh, they're rolling out a new sail package. They're not going to be clear anymore. They're tra transitioning over to North sails. Uh, this is a shot from some of the sail testing that's just gone on. Uh, you can see they're black. Uh, you're going to be a fair bit more durable. Uh, you have a lot of people uh, moving into the 49er and the FX who mm, are 18 years old, they're, this is the most powerful boat they're ever going to have driven in a while. And not having the sails clear was a huge feature uh, where it made it a lot harder to crash because you could always see where you're going. But now you can see there, the sails are no longer clear and there might be a bit much larger uh, risk of uh, some of the young teams crashing. So they put some of the biggest windows you can imagine in the sails, as you can see in this photo. And I, I think I have a feeling they're just going to slowly increase the window size because uh, being able to see other boats is pretty essential when you're going that fast. Uh, so we're currently in Greece for the Europeans. There'll be about 60 boats and it's going to be an interesting fleet because the Tokyo Olympics just finished um, and maybe five of the top 10 will retire. And then a number of the other people at the top of the Olympics uh, will be resting uh, this period of time. And so though there's 60 boats, not so many of them are top 10. Maybe it's only three or four boats in the top 10. Uh, and so it's a great opportunity to sail in a big fleet, but without a chunk of the people in front of us. I'm excited because it'll be some good pressure. We should be thrown down in the front. Talk about your training format. Another boat, a coach boat, what are you using? So I, our philosophy has been mostly just either training boat handling alone or racing. And I think that this is reflected more of our experience level where we've been trying to master the 49er and then trying to gain capability at, uh, tactically, where those have been the two priorities based on the experience profile that uh, Ian and I have brought into the campaign. Talk to us about a day in the life of a training and a day in the life in racing. What time do you get up in the morning on a training day? and give us a real fast summary of what you get accomplished that day. And then the same thing for a racing day. Uh, training, you wake up around eight, usually go to the gym for an hour and a half. Then you have two hours in the middle of the day where it's time to rest, recover a little bit, eat a bunch of food. Then training around one for three hours normally. Some of the other classes train for more, but the 49er is, it's more technical. So and it's technical and physically demanding. And as a result, uh, you can't train at your best for too long. As soon as you start to taper off at the end of the practice, yeah, you stop making the steps, you start stumbling, you can practice doing things wrong as a result. And so most people in the 49er rarely train more than three, three and a half hours. What time are you going to sleep? I don't sleep very well, to be honest. I try to go to bed around 11. We're constantly changing time zones. And so it's very hard to get into a solid sleep schedule. In all this traveling I've done, it's it can be pretty exhausting sometimes. And I found that as you learn more, you can really reduce the amount of grind you have to perform. You learn how to navigate in other languages. You learn how to travel. You learn exactly your routine in the airport. Now I know that, okay, when we're going to show up to the Europeans, we need to we land around noon. We rig the boat. You immediately go to the grocery store, get check into the hotel Airbnb, and that's your first day. And if you do that, you're all set up to go on day two. But if you go through, if you try to spread that out over certain days or land and sail on the first day, you're just going to be exhausted. Man. So you, you can optimize and make things a bit easier. But the one thing that you can never get around, or at least I've never found a way to get around, is jet lag. And then at, at the end of a practice day, then you finish practice, you do, uh, you have like another hour off, and then you have a meeting, and then you do your emails, and then you go to bed. And on a race, the race days are secretly way more relaxing than a practice day because your only job is to show up and race. For me, the only way I can sleep well is if I wake up at the same time every day. So 
I wake, I wake up at eight. Um, then the racing might be in the morning, might be in the afternoon. Usually if it's, if it's in the morning, you just uh, go through everything you're going to eat, show up and race. If it's in the afternoon, you have an hour, to, hour or two to kill in the morning. I kind of like to either just read a book, relax, not think about anything. Or I like to go through and like watch some racing video, but kind of get your mind ready to go, but, no, but nothing too, nothing too crazy. And then you show up and it's time to race. Uh, what, one thing that might amuse people is uh, what the nutrition's like uh, on any of these days where you, you wake up and you're basically eating complex carbs from the moment you wake up until the moment the practice ends. Uh, and the more you can eat, the better you eat until you're queasy. Uh, it's going to be impossible to ever eat enough before or during training. Then the second it's over, you eat a little, couple more carbs, and then you get to have normal people food. Not just for, for me, this looks like oatmeal, peanut butter, jelly sandwiches. It's funny when there's a wind delay because you'll wake up, have a coffee, have 2000 calories of carbs, and you are ready to go. Like it is time to race. And then if they put AP up, you're like, Ooh. <laughs> oh, what do I do now? Oh, I hope this is a short one. Ooh, okay, we're going to sit here. Talk about your pre-race checklist. When you get to the starting area, tell us what your routine is. I think the, the first step is to figure out what the type of day is. And you can tell almost immediately by looking at the geography. Is it going to be a shifty day or is it going to be a steady day? This determines so much your priorities for the rest of the day. Or if it's a steady day, speed and the start is going to be pretty much the entire race. And so you do some tuning laps. And then uh, you don't need to focus too much on the start. You just need to get back down to the start in time to check the bias, basically. When you say check the bias. This is something which I, I've i slowly developed and I'm, I, I've gotten to the level now. But when I first got into Olympic sailing, I was I just don't know how they do it. P people can just look at the, like feel the wind in their face and look at the two ends of the line and tell you what the bias is. Uh, and if I've, it, it's incredible when you first see it, if, they have the line even and they there's a general recall or something and they put the pin five degrees up, the entire fleet will see that difference and put their boat and the whole fleet will be right at the pin on the next start. So when you get out there, I, when I ask about your routine, when you get to the race course, are you going to set the kite a couple of times and uh, go up toward where the weather mark is? Give us a few of the other items on your mental checklist pre-start when you get to the racing venue. Yeah, exactly. You should get out there in the 49. Some people in other classes, lasers for seven years to get out there long before this, but in the 49, you get out there about 25, 30 minutes before the first start. You usually sail one lap of the course, set the kite. Um, and then you hang out, rest by the line and try to watch the shifts. If it's a shifty day, you're spending this whole time trying to like memorize the horizon, basically. To, so you know like what a lift and what a header is. And you might do more short laps up and down on, on a shifty day. One thing you might find amusing is if you get out there and it's 20, 20 to 25, most people don't do anything. They get to they get to like a hundred yards below the starting line and they just luff there until the start. Because anything else risks cap if you capsize before the race, your day is gonna be really hard. Why? Yeah. Because because capsizing is exhausting. It's like one capsize is like an entire race, basically. When you have the boat upright, your heart rate's usually near max. When you're at a bigger regatta, uh, you polish the boat, which you're probably everybody's probably familiar with, um, and you polish the, the rudder and the centerboard. And so if you capsize at a bigger regatta, you're, uh, the, the centerboard, which you're trying to stand on to right the boat, is like perfectly polished. You can't stand on it at all. You capsized, everybody's passing you, and you're standing on this perfectly polished board, like slipping off. And one thing I'm very excited about is uh, the new management and the direction that the US sailing team is taking with uh, Paul Kerr taking over and Project Pinnacle. It's a really exciting time to be on the US sailing team. Like, there's not so many times that a team or any organization sort of gets to regenerate like this and bring in such a successful uh, manager to like oversee the next steps. Um, and so, uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure what it's going to look like, but uh, there's, there's a lot of new personnel at like all levels of the team, as happens with any after any Olympics. The future is pretty bright. This is a photo of all the Americans at the uh, 2019 Worlds, and uh, pretty much all of them are back and uh, ready to go. And it's, it's going to be—I think it's going to be a good four years, a good three years going to Paris. So, tell me the last time you were satisfied with your performance in, in college. The New England Championship, my senior fall, we 
won by a substantial margin. I think only had like one race outside the top top couple. It was on the Charles River too, so there's pretty huge home field advantage. It was from some directions that uh, you kind of needed to know some local effects. So that was like nine years ago, eight years I, ago. I, yeah, I, I, thinking back through all the, like the the good overall results we've made, there's there's always been one day where I think we made some pretty unforced errors. I'm not. Sure, I don't think there's very few people you'd ask that question who'd say we would probably give a good answer. Actually, yeah. I've I've asked that question many times because I have a kind of a thesis. The people who are really brilliant at what they do are not fast to answer that question, and there aren't many times when they are satisfied. You and I know people who win Olympic bronze medals are not happy. And oh, yeah. Silver medals, not happy. Even though they're at the pinnacle of their game, they are constantly at the pinnacle because they're not satisfied with their performance and they're driven to do better and better and better. That's why I asked that question. So, so of all the good results we've made, there's always, I, I think I probably have forgotten most of the good racing. And uh, remember one race where we, like, we really punted something. <laughs> one, of the, one of the more useful pieces of advice I've ever been given uh, is that when you when something goes well, remember that as much as you remember when something goes bad. Because you, you need to remember what went right and then do that again, just as much as you need to learn from what went wrong. Tell me some moments when the crew saves your bacon. It happens all the time. Give me a couple examples. <laughs> uh, so go, going into the top mark, uh, you need to decide if you're going to straight set or jive set. Uh, and you're usually talking through it, but then at some point, like 30 seconds to the mark, the helmsman's going to be like, okay, we're going to do a straight set. We're going to do a jive set. I remember once we were going, we had an event in Portugal last winter, and uh, we're <laughs> coming up to the top mark. I say, okay, we're going to jive set. Ian doesn't, Ian doesn't say anything. He doesn't need to say anything, like, uh, but I don't hear anything. And then I look around and I, I see, ah, oh, there's a lefty over there. Like I go, no, 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 we're going to straight set. He goes, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, we, we're definitely straight setting. And another example is um, on the starting line, as I, any sailor knows, uh, you have two points very far away from each other. You need to draw an imaginary line between the two and be right on that line and go. Uh, and it's all about just develop over a long time developing the ability to see a straight line doing this you're talking about visualizing the starting line in three um, dimensions as you're sailing along mm -hmm. exactly and ian's just very good at that in our boat and i think in many boats uh it, ian will say three lengths here no 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 closer no closer essentially are you calling out the time to each other or do you both just keep looking at your watch what's your process on the start uh, Ian says time, the time intermittently, and I can, and I can at any point say time and he'll call out 14 seconds, but then you both count down in your head, uh, in the last little bit. So talk to us a little bit about what can go wrong in a 49er, flipping the boat down the breeze, up the breeze, a pitch polling, give us some insight into the scary side of the game. If you capsize up when something went wrong, you should not caps, even in 30 knots, you should not capsize up when. Really tricky maneuvers in the 49er are the bear away, the jibe, and the uh, spinner drop. Any moment that you need to have the boat perpendicular to the wind or change the sails downwind or change the sails downwind are tricky because the faster you're going, the safer you are. Anytime the boat slows down downwind, you're going to have big problems. And the most spectacular way to flip downwind is pitch pulling. That's where the bow sticks in a wave and the stern keeps going over the bow. And the boat can get almost completely vertical. One of the more famous 49er races ever was the medal race, Beijing Olympics in 2008. Jingdao, where they were sailing, was crazy light. It was under four knots every day. And then the last day uh, for the 49ers during the medal race, a big storm came through. It was 20 knots, huge waves. And because everybody had everything optimized for zero to four knots, they all got walloped. Uh, and so the first two photos you'll see are from that medal race, what, probably the most famous 49er race ever. Uh, the first is uh, this rather spectacular photo of uh, the Sabello brothers from Italy. I feel kind of bad including this in here because they're two of the nicest people you ever meet. Uh, the photo is pretty spectacular. So, <laughs> and then uh, so this is this is mid flip, uh, and then the next one is the British also pitch pulling same race, and you can see they've hit the water so fast that the boat's still upright. The boat's still completely vertical. And they're, they're that little splash down just to the right of the 
uh, of the bow. I'll tell you, when you're in the water looking back up at your boat, which is completely vertical, it's it's spectacular. It's like, how did my life end up in this position? Uh, it happens to the best of us. Here's Martine, uh, the FX helm swimming that I've been talking about a little bit. Uh, sometimes when you don't completely pitch pull, the helmsman or helmswoman gets ejected really far. And it's a good strategy to try to, you want to clear all the equipment. The way you get hurt uh, is if you don't land outside of the boat. Um, it, you can uh, go into the bow or the uh, helms person go into the sail here. And then you're, you're going to damage yourself or some of the equipment. And so when you get ejected, you kind of leap a little bit uh, and just try, try to get away from everything. You just want to hit water. Um, yeah, I mean, she, like, she's a double gold medalist, and this isn't a race of the world. Uh, so it, I remember we were in Portugal over the winter. Everybody was training in the like, really strong conditions they have there in the winter uh, in preparation for Tokyo. We've been there for a month, and I, like, we're still capsizing. And I was talking to her on the ramp one day and I was uh, like, I, like we've been here a month. I'm not sure I've gotten any better. And, I, and she said, oh, we've been here three months and I'm not sure I've gotten any better. Like it's, there's just an upper limit where the boats are hard to sail. It's not something you can ever graduate from. Like e everybody still flips. This is a uh, uh, Burling and Tuke uh, and one of the more spectacular flips ever. Uh, we're really not sure how they ended up in the situation, but it's one of the more famous photos in the 49er. Or if Pete's holding on for dear life, but I don't think they're going to save it. 49er flips are not fun for the people in the boat, but they make some good photos. <laughs> oh, and by the way, there, there are just as many uh, instances of uh, us doing this, but nobody sends you the photos afterwards. So, <laughs> Is that a goal to be famous enough so that your flips get library 49er hits? That would be wonderful. You're good enough that when you flip, everybody comes in after the day and says, they flipped today. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing the bloopers and the successes. As a Collegian All-American, you know, we give you all the good fortune in your attempt to make the 2024 U.S. Olympic team in Paris. Thanks once again for being our guest on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.